Behavioral Ecology Part B. In this presentation, we will focus on the interaction of the environment with behavior. The first place to start is to talk about where the organism lives, its habitat. An ecological or environmental area that is inhabited by a particular species. That's sort of the standard definition of an ecological habitat. It's going to be the environment from which the organism gets the resources that it needs for survival. Because of this, this aspect that the habitat is the place where we find the organism, we're going to see that the organism uses or exploits that habitat. And habitat use is defined as the way an organism uses the collection of conditions and resources in the habitat. Now, typically, this is measured as a sort of relative amount of time spent in different areas of the habitat. Um, the more time spent in a certain area means it's using the resources in that particular part of the habitat more. So this can be measured for individuals or populations. Now, habitat use will change based upon what the organism is doing. So you'll have specific uh, behavioral specific habitat use, such as foraging behaviors or denning behaviors or resting or nesting or reproductive behaviors. So habitat use is sort of where is the organism picking up its resources that it needs for survival. Within this, because the organism is using different parts of the habitat differentially, that is preferentially in certain areas, is the concept of habitat selection. That is that the organism is actively going to certain parts of the habitat to get the resources it needs. This is the process, both innate and learned, by which the organisms choose the habitat and the components that it's going to use. Again, this is usually done sort of relative to availability. For instance, if you look at this little graph, what we have is uh, a graph looking at habitat selection in tiger sharks. Um, this horizontal line indicates no pattern or preference. Anything above this line would be a habitat preference or selection. Anything below this line would be a habitat uh, avoided or uh, an avoidance pattern. Here what you see with these tiger sharks is that they spend more time, they select for shallow bank areas rather than deep waters. They're using the shallow bank areas more than we would have expected, so that's a habitat preference or habitat selection. One of the reasons that organisms are going to select different parts of their habitat is because habitats vary in quality. The, that is, the degree, degree to which they supply the resources the organism needs, and therefore the degree to which they promote individual fitness and population growth. As an example, I show here in both of these graphs uh, a fence, and you see on the left side in both uh, of these photographs on the left side, the habitat certainly looks of better quality. It's greener, more diverse than the habitat on the right side of the fence in each case. So the idea is that habitats can vary in quality and therefore in the amount or types uh, uh, of resources that they provide for an organism. Organisms select the, and use their habitat in basically two main ways. One is through a home range, which is the portion of the habitat that's sort of used on a daily or seasonal basis. It's the place where they sort of roam around to get their food, their water, their mates, their hiding places, their nesting places. It's a home range. Sometimes, some organisms, not all organisms, but some organisms will Will, will establish territories, which are a small part, or in some cases the whole home range, but often a small part of the home range, that they actively defend and repel other individuals so that they have exclusive use of this part of the habitat, and that's called a territory and territorial defense. Territories can be, can be um, established for a variety of reasons, but the most typical reason is food resource. 
that is, that were sequestering or establishing more or less exclusive use of a particular food or a particular resource that the organism needs. The, this, uh, if you think of it in this term, that in these terms, that is a food resource, you realize that the bigger the animal, the more resources it needs, the more food it needs. So we find the size of food resource territories often increase as a function of body mass. And that's what these graphs are showing. As a result of this, what we find is there's a cost benefit that, that starts to occur with territories and often determines territory size. That is, as territories increase, that is, large animals needing larger territories, as these territories increase, they become more difficult to patrol and to defend. Therefore, we often find that large animals have larger territories predicted uh, than predicted based upon their energetic needs, but these territories often overlap, whereas small organisms, uh, and again, I'll refer to the, uh, the little diagram at the top of the slide, uh, small organisms such as a mouse will have a smaller territory, but their territories tend not to overlap. Large organisms, a giraffe here, you see will have large territories because they have large energetic needs. And those territories tend to overlap because they can't actively defend them. So territory size will not only be based upon food resource availability, but also on the energetic costs of patrolling and defending those territories. Territory size is also related to sexual selection. Because again, the territory has some innate uh, resource involved, food, hiding places, nesting places, uh, those sorts of things. Um, territory size can be related to sexual, uh, sexual success, that is reproductive success. Here you see that territory size, for instance, can increase the number of females that a male may have access to. Larger territories draws more females, more females gives more opportunities for copulation, improved fitness for the male. So you see territory uh, size can be related to uh, reproductive success. We'll talk more about this in class, but I just want you to have an idea about this right now. As part of this process of moving around in habitats and in home ranges, we can talk about two types of movements, migration and dispersal. Um, dispersal we often think of as a sort of one-way movement. To migration is cyclical. Let's talk about that a little bit. Migration is, as I said, seasonal movement of animals from one region to another. They go from a winter area to a summer area, from the summer area to a winter area, back and forth. Often we think of birds, and as you look at this table, you'll see that it's populated mainly by birds, but there are insect species such as the monarch, monarch butterfly. There are mammal species such as caribou and wildebeests and zebras. Uh, there are marine species such as humpback whales, uh, which, which also migrate. Um, true, mainly birds, but there are a variety of other species as well. Migration is a very complicated concept and a very interesting uh, ecological behavior. Um, we really can't spend a lot of time on it here. Uh, if, if we were, you know, in an animal behavior class, we would spend several, several weeks talking about migration. The key here is that migration is under both environmental and genetic control. The main environmental control is day length, probably second by temperature, which are used as cues for determining, hey, it's time to migrate. Um, navigation, to get from one place to the other, you need navigational clues. You need to be able to decide, find out how to get from point A to point B. Animals typically use the sun and the stars for celestial cues so that they can navigate. They use the Earth's magnetic field. They even have in, inherent genetic mental maps that help them uh, get from one place to another. It's a fascinating concept. Dispersal is one-way movement of an individual from the area where it was born, its natal area, to some different area. Now, the opposite of dispersal is phylopatry, or, or patry, I should say, phylopatry, which is the lack of dispersal. 
So if you stay in the same, same area, you're phyllopatric. There are two types of dispersal, saturation dispersal and pre-saturation dispersal. Saturation dispersal is dispersal to get away from shortages, such as food, food or excessive competition. You pick up and move because the pr competition pressure is just too much. Pre-saturation dispersal occurs before the resources, sort of almost in anticipation of the resources becoming sparse. Um, what we see here is there's always, uh, there's often, I won't say always, there's often a percentage of individuals that will disperse pre-saturation and then as conditions become more and more crowded, more and more individuals uh, as it becomes saturated, more and more individuals will disperse. So pre-saturation tends to be a smaller amount of individuals. Saturation dispersal, as it becomes more and more crowded, a greater and greater percentage of individuals will, will saturation disperse. Why would individuals uh, disperse pre-saturation? In other words, what are the fitness benefits of pre-saturation dispersal? Well, it can be because of other resources. For instance, if you have a better chance of finding mates in a different area, you may disperse ahead of time to sort of get there first and get, get your choice of a mate or have a better chance of mating. This, this is one very powerful concept. The other is a genetic benefit in that as a population increases and if they stay and crowning conditions begin to occur, you begin to have what's referred to as inbreeding and I'll, I'll define that in a second. And uh, you, uh, the benefit of being a pre-saturation dispersal individual is that you can avoid this inbreeding. And this is, is a potentially uh, valuable uh, contribution to your fitness. Here you see in this graph that in mice, the litter size decreases. So there's a real reproductive disincentive with increasing intensity of inbreeding. So as crowding occurs and inbreeding increases, reproductive failure or reproductive success begins to drop. Reproductive failure increases. And this, this is a real disincentive for staying. So you can see where pre-saturation dispersal may be advantageous. Um, I just mentioned briefly, again, population genetics uh, sort of rears its head here. Uh, the concept of inbreeding is the production of offspring from the mating of individuals that are closely related as far as genetics go. That is, they share many genes. Um, we actually can calculate something called a coefficient of inbreeding that measures uh, the probability that any two alleles in, in an individual uh, are the same by uh, descent, are identical by descent. Um, the idea here is, is that as you share more and more genes, that is, if you have more and more identical genes, you're going to become more and more homozygous for those genes. And if those genes are deleterious, particularly in their recessive form, now you have two copies. You are homozygous and you may begin to show those deleterious or, or detrimental effects. So inbreeding can be detrimental from that perspective. Now, I want to say here just parenthetically that inbreeding is not totally bad. Uh, uh, for a natural population, but I, I'm not going to be able to address that right here. It will come up in later lectures, but the idea that I want you to have here is that if you have excessive inbreeding, you have this potential for deleterious or damaging genes to be expressed in the phenotypes. So what are the take-home points here? Species have genetically based habitat preferences, Territorial behavior provides the individual with exclusive access to critical resources. Movements such as migration and dispersal ensure access to favorable conditions and critical resources. Territoriality, migration, and dispersal occur with the benefits of those behaviors exceed the costs of those behaviors, which makes sense. And again, I bring that up a lot here that we want to think in terms of cost benefit and risk benefit because organisms operate that way. Now, 
the next aspect that I want to mention is something we refer to as a social system. And a social system is simply an aggregation of individuals that live together. It may have a structure to it, a hierarchy, a pecking order, in which there are so-called, for instance, the classic is a wolf pack, where there's an alpha male and female couple that is sort of in charge of the wolf pack. Um, but they don't have to be that rigorously controlled. Um, but they can be. Um, so there is this sort of hierarchy. There are three fundamental components of a social system. The size and composition of that uh, social system, that group, that is how big is it, and uh, are there males and females, male, more males, more females, is it male dominated, female dominated, etc. The degree of cooperation among individuals and what is specifically the mating system. All this will determine how the social systems work. All three result from the evolution of behaviors. Let's look at the size of social systems. Social systems, uh, the size of a social group will be determined by evolutionary factors. That is, if the population gets too large, we have problems with inbreeding, we have problems with resource competition and so forth. If the population, uh, the group is too small, you may not have the benefits of being in a group in any way. So the, the uh, size of a social group will depend upon the abundance, distribution, and type of resources and the interactions of these individuals within the group. One really interesting aspect of social groups is cooperation. For instance, typically we can think of cooperative hunting, as you can see here in the picture, a pack of wolves ganging up or hunting together, in this case for this bison. Uh, we can also have shared care of young. We can have, in some cases, selfless behaviors, sacrificial behaviors within a group called altruistic behaviors. Altruism is this selfless act where you sacrifice um, the the example would be in humans uh, where you would run into a burning building to save uh, uh, someone that you barely know or you don't know at all, a stranger. Okay, that's altruistic behavior. The, the problem comes up is how can you have cooperation and altruistic behavior evolve? Uh, if we're thinking about getting genes into the next generation uh, and promoting our own reproductive success, uh, how do altruistic behaviors come about? Well, in order to answer that, we have to talk about fitness. And remember, fitness is the term that's used in genetics to describe contribution to the next generation. That is, the genes placed in the next generation. And you are more fit if you put more genes in the next generation. You are less fit if you put less genes in the next generation. And then those individuals, those offspring, have to survive to reproductive age to be fit. <clears throat> now, Inclusive fitness, more or less what I just described, let me back a track for a second. What I just described that is producing offspring, producing genes and offspring for the next generation is really referred to, for, for now, let's call it direct fitness because there's a direct relationship. There's also what's referred to as inclusive fitness, which is the relative ability to transfer one's genes or copies of them to the next generation, the relative ability. Fitness, therefore, is going to be based either upon personal reproductive success, that direct, that direct fitness I just talked about, or that of individuals that carry copies of one's genes. Who carries copies of your genes? Your relatives carry copies of your genes. First of all, again, let's use that direct one, parent to offspring. Offspring share half the genes of each parent. They get half from mom, half from dad. By the way, obviously, we're talking about sexually reproducing organisms here. So an offspring, 50% of the genes uh, of your genes are placed into your offspring. Siblings, brothers and sisters, each share 50% of their genes. Grandparent to grandchild, so my grandchildren, I don't have any, but if I were to have grandchildren, those grandchildren have 25% of my genes. As an uncle, and I am an uncle, aunt and uncle, my nephews and nieces share 25% of my genes. First cousins, about 12.5%. So you get the idea here that this 
inclusive fitness could include these organisms or these individuals that aren't directly produced as offspring but share common genes. This inclusive fitness actually explains in many cases cooperative behavior because I'm helping relatives and as the genes for altruism in uh, excuse me genes for altruism could increase if the relative amount of genes shared increases. In other words, the greater the coefficient of relatedness, the more benefit, the greater chance of altruism. This often requires, uh, let me just rephrase that a little bit more. So the more related you are to an individual, the more likely you are to help that individual and the more sense it makes because it increases your fitness more. Offspring have 50% of your genes. Grandchildren have 25% of your genes. Cousins have 12.5% of your genes. You see what I'm saying here. So you're actually helping promote your fitness by helping in the survival and reproduction of those individuals. This often but not always requires kin recognition, being able to tell that you're related to the individual. Therefore, altruism, which is this cooperative or helpful behavior, uh, can occur, and these sometimes occur at reproductive uh, events um, and can be adaptive to individuals if they are related. Uh, animal examples, uh, I'm probably not making myself clear. Animal examples, for instance, bird species, we have find that previous year siblings, that is offspring from the previous year in many bird species will help parents raise offspring in the subsequent year. That is, they come back to the nesting place, mom and dad are raising a new family, having new offspring, and last year's offspring help raise those new offspring. Why? Because they're siblings. They share half their genes. This turns out to be beneficial to the siblings, to the helpers, if they cannot mate on their own. If they can mate on their own, of course, that's a better way to go because they're going to put, they're going to produce their own gene combinations and put their own genes in the next generation. But by helping uh, mom and dad, that is their parents raise siblings, they will also be included, uh, increasing their inclusive fitness. So cooperative reproductive behaviors are based upon uh, relatedness that is, the sharing of genes. So what are the take-home points? Altruism, if it's directed towards kin, towards relatives, may be adaptive. But if it's directed towards non-kin, kin, it's generally not going to be adaptive. So helping strangers, unrelated strangers, could be problematic. Helping relatives, you see, would increase fitness. Cooperative breeding may result from kin selection, or from the improbability that that individual can leave the group and find a mate, that sort of cooperation. So I'll, I can't mate on my own, so I will help uh, relatives breed and therefore increase, increase my inclusive fitness. The social system integrates a collection of behaviors that are adaptive in a, in a specific environment.